See the goodness, the compassion of Almighty God once more manifested in his Gospels. The leper approaches Christ. He knows the power of God. He has heard of all the miracles that our Lord had already worked, the cures he had performed on the sickest of people. And so he knew the power of God. He approaches Christ for a cure. He believes in that power to heal his misery. However, the leper does not know if Christ will put this power into use in his case. Thus the leper cries out, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Our Lord, in his goodness, stops. He takes the time to listen to the request, a prayer really, of the poor leper. And he looked on this poor leper's misery with the greatest compassion as he did all the sick with whom he came into contact. And he responded in these beautiful words, I will it. Be thou made clean. And he went and showed himself to the priests. And indeed, the cure was worked. Then our Lord continued on his journey, always the very active missionary in search of souls. And he moved on to Capernaum, which was sort of his, his home base, you might say. Like St. Gertrude's would be my home base. I do, we do all the traveling from there. And then we always return. Capernaum was home base for our Lord. And upon his arrival to that city, a certain centurion approached him. Now this centurion too knows that Christ has the power and the omnipotence to heal. And so he comes to our Lord with those words of faith, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy. He simply states the case. What is wrong? And our Lord, compassionate towards the miserable again, as always says, says to the centurion, I will come down to your house and heal him. And the centurion, notice the centurion's simple, childlike faith. He will not even accept our Lord's coming down to the house to heal him. He knew, needs no sign. He knows that God can work a miracle ten miles away just as well as he can in the very house. And so he says in simple faith, Lord, all you have to do is say the word, paraphrasing what he said. Do not come. I am not worthy. And he said, he based his reasoning on this, saying, well, I'm a centurion. I too have men under me. I say, go here, and the soldier obeys. I say, do this, and he doeth it. Well then, if you simply command the palsy to be cured, all things will follow. Whatever you say will be done. See that simple faith. And it says at the end of the gospel that our Lord marveled at such a faith. You know, I, th I was thinking, preparing this sermon, that our Lord must marvel, even today, on those rare occasions when somebody actually gets it right. I mean, how we view God. The Novus Ordo religion teaches that he is a God with arms open for everyone. Come as you are. No need to change. That wedding garment mentioned in the gospel that you need to enter this, this banquet Oh no, don't worry, you're good. Without that wedding garment of charity, forget it. Bring your shorts and your tank tops and your beach balls, that's good. All the better. God in the Novus Ordo is just 
Well, he's one of the guys, a pal, a buddy, and nothing more. He is the one who is upstairs simply to do your will, what you want him to do, rather than vice versa. And he is a buddy who never insists on his way. And if he does, well, then you can just slam the door on his face and there will be no consequences because, of course, there is no sin, there is no hell in the Novus Ordo. Muslim, well, just be a good one. The gates of heaven are open for you. John Paul II said that one. Homosexual, oh, don't worry. That's how I made you. And it's good. No need to change. Are you a tranny? Well, as they say, good on you. And then, you boys, you prefer wearing makeup and putting on skirts and looking all pretty? Well, go ahead. It's how you express yourself. It's all good. It teaches a false compassion, a false love, and a false mercy. For a love with no notion of sacrifice is a false love. It cannot exist. An indulgent love is preached in the Novus Ordo, a love which has no restraints on self. Whatever you love, you must seek after, and it's okay. In fact, no one has the right to tell you anything any differently. And if they do, well, they're the ones being uncharitable. Following the laws of God, the natural law, or well, those who insist on those things, they're Pelagians and they're hypocrites in the new world religion. Theirs is a love in the Novus Ordo which avoids conflict, which is all accepting, except when it comes to the true faith to all of its maxims and all of its principles, then they turn on us. It is a love centered not on God, but on man. And so you see it in the way they worship. They no longer, as you very well know, face the tabernacle where God is supposed to be. Now they face the people with their back to the tabernacle, and they converse throughout their mass with the people. And somehow they're supposed to ex have an experience with God in his creation, in his man. That's the whole purpose of it. It is God-centered. And there is no more... They might as well take this quote out of the Scriptures when our Lord said, If you love me, Keep my commandments. It's all gone. God, Christ is detached from his cross. Remember what our Lord said? Greater love than this no man hath. Did he lay down his life for his friends? What is the greatest act of love? The crucifixion. And it happens every day on our holy altar with holy mass. It is the representation of the crucifixion, of the first Good Friday. But you see in their churches how well they've removed Christ from the cross to show a sort of love that no longer means sacrifice. That no longer, ex that our Lord no longer expects you to give up your evil ways. The cross in Christian life, which is used to show our love for Him, well, it's all removed. We're risen from that cross. This is the love that the Novus Ordo will teach. On the other hand, I think that we Catholics, 
we get it wrong quite often too. How do you view God and his love and all of the rest? I think that we tend to see God as all justice and no mercy. And always looking for the opportunity to punish and taking delight in it. Just waiting around the corner for us to slip and make a little mistake and then he clubs us a good one. I believe truly that that is how we so often think, many of us Catholics, even the best among us. And then we get all discouraged and we think it's hopeless because we fall so much. How our Lord must marvel in today's society when somebody actually gets it right. But, you know, he did give us a saint. God always does this. He always designs a saint for every particular period of history. Whenever there's a need, there is a saint that is molded for that need. So we had St. Dominic when the Albigenses came out. We had a St. Athanasius during the time of the Arian crisis. Well, even today, we have a Pope St. Pius X because God foresaw that we would have all of these problems with modernism. He gave us a saint, but we have no pope now. He gave us a saint who was a pope, who already pointed out all of the, the errors and the heresies of the Vatican II faith, so that you and I might be able to have a saint to follow in these confusing times. But when it comes to the spiritual life, he gave us the little flower, whom Pius X called the greatest saint of modern time. How do you look at God? Well, the little flower, she has a good balance here. She's not too self-indulgent, nor is she overly strict. I talked about this a little last year, but thought a little refresher is, is good. Her spiritual doctrine was this. Deus caritas est. God is love. St. John the Apostle says that in the sacred scriptures. We must believe it by faith. It is a truth when we say this, that God loves us and that he loves us infinitely and with an everlasting love. This is a truth that we must believe but it is a truth that we so often just gloss over. We take it for granted. We say, yeah, that's true, and then we go on to something else. Or those more pessimistic people say, well, how can God ever love such a miserable wretch as myself? And they ignore it. But Tertullian says, no one is such a father as God. God is love and God loves me. That's the first principle upon which her spiritual life rests. The second is this, that God loves us not only in spite of, but because of our wretchedness. Not that he loves our sin, he hates all sin, but that our wretchedness and our helplessness, as it were, attracts him down to us. It, in a sense, moves him to compassion. He sees our misery, and he wants to help our misery. It's just like the scene in today's Gospel. He sees the misery of the leper. It's moved to compassion. He wants to help and fix the problem. Wasn't it our misery, after all, that made the incarnation necessary? God saw that we could never pay back the debt that we sinners owed his Father. So he took on human nature. He allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. He shed all of his blood and he paid our debt. But not as this, the Protestants would say that we have nothing more to pay. It's a freebie now. No, we still have to fill up what is lacking, as St. Paul says. But he nailed our death sentence to 
the cross. What love and what compassion. But she says, those are the first two points, that God loves us, and he loves us because of our wretchedness. St. Therese says it's very important not to, to reverse the order of that. If you think first of your wretchedness, well, then that leads to depression, discouragement, despair. You must think first, God loves me. And then God loves me because of my wretchedness. Third, she says that God thirsts for our love. Imagine that. Almighty God, who has no need of us, he is infinitely and perfectly happy in heaven by himself. He has no need of us, but he thirsts to have our love. He thirsts to have your love. Because your love, the love that you can give and show to Almighty God, is unique. So unique that no other soul on earth could give him the same love in the same way. St. Therese compares it to flowers. Some of them are absolutely gorgeous and you can see them a mile away. Others you barely see when they're next to your foot. Some of them let off a beautiful fragrance and others, like that little weed, the grass that smells like onions, when you pick it and break it apart, it smells like onions. Well, she says all the flowers, they, they do something differently. They show forth the glory of God in different ways, but it's all pleasing to him. And so whether you be that beautiful rose that is very attractive for him to look at and to smell, or you be that little piece of onion grass, makes no difference because God made you that way. As long as you're giving off that onion scent, you're good. You are doing exactly what God wants, loving him in the way he wants you to. And all of this so far leads us to humility and confidence in God. That even though we fall at times, we can go back to the first principle. God does indeed love us and has compassion on our falls. He will be there for us as he was for the lepers to heal them and to bring them to himself. So, Lastly, all we need to make this system work, to grow in virtue, is a little bit of goodwill. That's why it's called the little way. It doesn't expect you to do great things. It expects you to have goodwill. That is, to always have the great desire to love and to serve God. And then God will take care of the rest. You have to be open at every moment, seeing, wasting nothing that happens to you throughout the day. Use every moment as a fresh grace, as a fresh way to prove, to show that you truly love God. So today let us ask the little flower, St. Therese, to give us a true understanding of God's love for us, and how we, in turn, ought to respond to this love and thus become a great saint. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.